Welcome to the NBA Outlet Preview Series presented by OTGBasketball.com. Make sure you follow OTG on Twitter at OTG Basketball. Also hit that subscribe button. I'm your host, Nick Faye. With me on this episode, my co-host, Corey Waldron, and OTG draft guru, Xavier Clyborn. What's up, guys? What's up? Nice to be here. Beautiful night. I like it. We got three in the house again. A new big three. Let's get started. <laughs> new big three in the house. Ready to talk about a top 20 team tonight. The first top 20 team in our rankings you know, our writers came up with these, but we're going to break it down. Number 20, Dallas Mavs. But before we talk about that, let's talk about the Mavs from last season. Yeah, last season was not the best season for Dallas. They went 33-49. and 49. That was 11th in the West. Um, really, I think the biggest thing that they realized is they had to go into the offseason, they needed to find their starting point guard. I went through the old roster from last season, and they went through eight point guards. I'm, I'm going to read them all. The eight point guards are Darren Williams, Yogi Ferrell, J.J. Barea, Devin Harris, Jonathan Gibson, Quinn Cook, Pierre Jackson, and Manny Harris. That, that, that's too many point guards, way too many point guards. So you clearly see that. And, and also in the team stats, they were last in the league, close to bottom of the league in assists per game at 20.8. So clearly they needed to find playmakers for their offense. Wow, yeah. Um... I didn't realize they had so many point guards. I mean, we always talk about how the point guard position in the NBA is probably the most important, you know, one of the top and most important positions. And, you know, not having a playmaker, like you mentioned, I mean, they also had the worst, rank, the worst ranking offense in the league, only averaging 97.9 points per game, which, you know, obviously plays a part. Like you said, they were in the bottom of the league with assists per game as well. Hopefully they – you know, we'll talk about him in a little bit, but Dennis Smith Jr. kind of fills that void that they've been looking for. I mean, I thought Yogi Ferrell did a really good job to end last season. Um, him, after he was with the Brooklyn Nets, uh, he really stepped up for them. I mean, he had one game where he had, I think, eight threes in a game or nine threes in a game times. Um, Darren Williams, uh, he had a decent stretch, even though we know that he's a, as inconsistent as they come. Um I mean, last year was interesting because Nick mentioned this off the podcast. This was a team that started off the year terrible. And, you know, near the end of the season, I think I started just a slightly better. If Dirk maybe wasn't missing the first couple games of the – well, several games to start off the season, this was a team that probably could have been eighth seed. Yeah, that start that you mentioned, you know, Xavier mentioned it too. They went through a ton of point guards. But they started the season, I believe, 4-16. and 16. You know, when you get in yourself in a hole like that, it's hard to get out of that. And I think they finished the season around like 500. So, if, you know, they came out with a better start. Like you said, they probably could have competed for an eight seed. You saw some nice things from some of the young guys. You mentioned Yogi Ferrell. They made a trade for Nerlens Noel. Harrison Barnes kind of stepped up into a bigger role after signing that contract. So there was good things. There also was bad things. Obviously, you know, there was some injuries and just a lot of inconsistent play. A real quick point. Their problem was really just offense because I'm looking at the defense and numbers. They were number four in points allowed. They were number three in opponents' points in the paint, which I think the acquisition of New Orleans the well helped that out. They were six in assist allowed, which means they were getting out, you know, making teams work for their offense. Like defensively, I think they were fine. Just offensively, when you don't have a lot of playmakers, because Wesley Matthews not a playmaker, JJ Barea is really not a, a playmaker. Dirk Nowitzki, you kind of see him on the downside of his career. But but defensively, I was surprised looking at the numbers. That defensively, it was actually all right. But when you when you when your top gun and Harrison Barnes only give you 19 points per game, you know offensively they need to find ways to get easier shots for themselves. Yeah, I mean when you look at them defensively, they definitely have some nice pieces. Like you mentioned, Nerlens Noel was definitely a big acquisition, and they re-signed him this offseason. We'll talk about that in a little bit. But what would you say was the highlight of the Mavs season? The highlight of this season was finding Yogi Ferrell that just fell into their arms. Yogi Ferrell played really well last season. For a guy that was that went undrafted, that was on the Brooklyn Nets roster, how did Brooklyn not see that they had a legitimate point guard on their hands? I don't know, but he was a lone bright spot because he came in and gave him some stability at that point guard position. Remember, Dan Williams missed a lot of games last season due to injuries and also being a little bit out the door. But Yogi Ferrell was a bright spot, and I figured that he fits into their future plans because at best, at best case scenario. He's your legitimate backup point guard for Dennis Smith. And I think between him and Dennis Smith, we have a very good one-two punch at the point guard position. Yeah, I, I definitely agree that Yogi was um, was definitely a, a, a diamond in the rough, if, if you would. 
Um, for me, I'm going to say Harrison Barnes. Only because when the Warriors lost that NBA Finals to the Cleveland Cavaliers, I remember posting a tweet about Harrison Barnes in that series. I think like four points per game and the end of that series in the final four games. And he shot like 12% from three. And like last year coming, you know, getting that big contract, you know, 24 years old, you know, he, he may not be a superstar. Um, I mentioned it's all the pot of Nick. He, he's more like probably a two or a three option. Like money well spent. Like you said, he averaged 19.2 points per game. I mean, he shot 46% from the field, 35% from three. He gave five rebounds per game. And as a guy who's 24 years old, you know, Dirk's getting a little bit older. Yogi's young. They got uh, Dennis Smith Jr. in the draft. You know, Harrison Barnes looked like he could be a really nice piece going forward for the Mavericks. Yeah, it was nice to see Barnes because obviously there was a lot of question marks going to the season, you know, like stepping away from the Warriors, not playing with Steph Curry, Clay Thompson, Draymond Green. And, you know, he he showed he can still ball. Obviously, there's still some improvements for him to make. For me, I guess I was going to go with Harrison Barnes, but let's go with Seth Curry. I think he established mm-hmm. himself as an NBA player last year. You know, he's definitely going to give them some solid shooting off the bench, and he showed up, and he's not just Steph's little brother anymore. Yeah, Seth Curry played a, a very good por- por- portion of the year last season where, you know, you could see him getting more comfortable in his own game, not just being a three-point shooter, being able to put the ball on the floor, being able to attack the basket, get to the free throw line. And also, if you watch closely, he emerges as one of the leaders of the basketball team, which, you know, usually you don't see that from a guy come off the bench. But I look for him to take that next step where – you could possibly see him be a six man of the year contender contender if the Mavericks can somehow get into the playoff picture. Yeah, no, that's very true, especially with that shooting potential. And this team could definitely use some scoring. So he could definitely give him some pop off the bench. But big, biggest disappointment for the Mavs last season. Oh, where to start? <laughs> um, <laughs> biggest disappointment would have been, to me, Darren Williams. Even though they did part ways with him midseason, I just think that that experiment didn't work out. Also, and and I love this guy. You know, he's been a, he's been he's a Hall of Famer. He's an All Star. He's been an MVP. But Dirk Nowinski, for me personally, I feel like Dirk Nowinski is almost handcuffing the Dallas Mavericks because they're not going to try to rebuild as long as Dirk is there. They're going to try to compete and make the playoffs since they don't want to waste Dirk's last years as an NBA player. But really, you know, he looked a step slow offensively. Averaged a decent fourteen points per game as a game, but you can just see like he's on the downturn and they need to really find their replacement at that fourth spot for Dirk. Yeah, uh, Darren Williams has to be like the easiest choice for this, but I- I'm going to go with you on Dirk. Um, the Even though Dirk wasn't horrible and unplayable, um, you could already see though in a lot of uh, the, the styles that they played, they were really hiding Dirk on defense. Uh, you know, Dirk being 38 years old, He's, he's very slow. I mean, he was never a very fast player to begin with, but uh, age has certainly caught up with him on the speed side. He almost looks like Peyton Manning running around a football field out there on the court. He just isn't very limber. Um, and like you said, I, I do agree that he, he's definitely stunning the growth of this rebuild because, like you said, that while you have an NBA champion in Dirk Nowitzki, you're not going to go full rebuild. It's kind of like that Kobe situation with the Lakers a couple years ago. You know, you're going to try and compete. It would be yeah. different. It, it, it would be different different if they weren't trying to feature him in the offense. They were last in the league at fast fast break points per game at 7.8 points per game in the fast break. That's because they would wait for Dirk to come down, let him get maybe a post touch, maybe, you know, break a move. And at this point in his career, you just can't think of him as a top three option on your team because even though he, was, he could still shoot from him, but he can't be that guy no more where you give him the ball, get out the way, let me get a bucket. Even at crunch time, I would like for them to go towards Harrison Barnes rather than going towards Dirk Nowinski. He, and they won't be able to move forward until he retires. I mean, personally, I could see, you know, your guys' point about it, but I don't think Dirk was that, you know, negative on the team, especially because he takes a pay cut to be there. He only played like 26 minutes a game. He's going to be in a limited role this year. And last year they had so many injuries and unproven players. I don't think it was a big deal. If he comes in this year and he takes touches away, I think now it's like Harrison Barnes' team. And, you know, now it's going to be, you know, if Dirk takes the ball from him in a clutch situation and takes a bad shot, then, you know, you could be mad. But I think last year it wasn't as big a deal. I'm going to always take an opportunity to agree with you on Darren Williams being a disappointment. <laughs> <laughs> you know, after watching him in Brooklyn, 
you know, and like you guys mentioned, even when he was in Cleveland, there was times it just looked like he didn't want to be there. I think Richard Jefferson said something about it too. And like the Warriors would be happy when Darren Williams stepped on the court and that yeah, he just, was more interested in other, you know, things like MMA instead of basketball. He is literally a shell of himself. He was a shell of himself last year. He really needs to hang it up. It, it's yeah, done. It's he hasn't signed anywhere yet. Well, there it is. So, but yeah, uh, I mean, I, what was the stat in the playoffs when when uh, Darren Williams went scoreless? The Cavs lost, I think, every single game, and he yeah. went scoreless. You know that four times in the NBA Finals. And, and it's just it's, crazy to think what type of player he was. His days in Utah, even early with the Nets, you know, he still had some big scoring games. He dropped fifty in a game, and now you know, last year he couldn't even get one point in the finals. Where are these Chris Paul, Darren William uh, debates now of who's the better yeah. point guard? <laughs> you say that. You say that they have to. They have to ask you for a drug to make sure that you're all right. You know <laughs> but let's talk about the Mavs ranking. Like I mentioned, this is our first top twenty team. Mavs in at number twenty. Do you guys think this is a fair rankings for that? Fair ranking for them, or too high, too low? I personally think that's a. It's just a smidge too high. Because if we think about it, that put them as a top ten team in the West, which would put them relatively in playoff contention. I think they more should be more down towards like 23, 24, 25. Honestly, Dennis Smith does give him a lot of hope. He gives him a lot of hope. And we're going to get into him further on the show. But I think just from – I look at this team as a whole, and I'm trying to figure out what their identity is. What What is this team going to hang their hat on? Are they going to be a scoring team, a defensive team? Are they going to be moving the ball around? Are they going to be ISO heavy, pick and roll? I just don't know until I see them in action. So until I see them in action, because of a lack of identity, I'm going to have to go a little bit lower than where they ranked at. Yeah, uh, I'm going to say this is also slightly too high. Um, you know, we're talking about a team that won 33 games last year. Uh, they didn't add a star talent. A lot of nice pieces. Like, I, I'm glad they were able to keep New Orleans the well. Um, I'm glad that they – they got, you know, Dennis Smith Jr. in the draft. You know, I'm not sure how much of an impact he can make early on or how many wins he can add early on. Um, and like you said, Xavier, this team has, you know, Josh McRoberts is on this roster. Not, I don't know why I'm picking out Josh McRoberts because he's not like an <laughs> awful NBA player. But, like, I just don't see he's teams that win a, lot of, win a lot of games with Josh McRoberts <laughs> on their roster. <laughs> no, well, with Josh – we don't we don't get into him later. We'll get into him later. I got I got an interesting point about Josh that I want I just want to throw out there that might that might be good news for Mavericks fans. Might be. Wow. I mean, I, I'm interested. I, I'm intrigued. I think this ranking at 20, like you guys said, maybe a touch too high, but they're around this range. You know, Rick Carlisle as coach is obviously he's always does good things with the Mavs, and having Nerlens Noel for the full season will probably have an impact. They probably will be a little bit better than last year, but like you said. Maybe not tenth in the West, maybe more in that eleventh and twelfth spot. Yeah, but you guys Absolutely. mentioned it. We uh, we got additions to talk about. Obviously, the one that caught all the hype, and that's Dennis Smith Jr. in the draft, number nine overall. You know, put on a show in summer league. Obviously, Xavier, you know, you're a big draft guy for OTG. What were your thoughts on him in summer league, and what do you like about his game? As a Knicks fan, I'm kicking, I'm kicking myself <laughs> in the leg. Why do we not draft this kid? During summer league, he looked. As, as well as prepared of an NBA player as you're going to see in Summer League. Almost reminded me of when Damian Lillard was in Summer League. He just, you could just tell he shouldn't be playing in Summer League. This competition is not good enough for him. He was under control that you didn't really see a lot in college. He's under control. Showed that he can shoot the three ball very well, can get to the basket at will, can get teammates involved. It was maturity. You know, a lot of times on the floor, he was being very vocal, being a leader in the huddle. I was very impressed with Summer League. I feel as though after, like, the second or third game, we, we don't need to risk injury in Summer League. He was very impressive to me. I was I was beyond – as a Knicks fan, like I said, I'm like, why do we not take this guy? We did not see it in NC State. A lot of maturity. He was playing hard on defense, running out to the passing lanes, playing hard, being vocal. It, he, 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 he impressed me in Summer League. Very, very, very much. Yeah, uh, the one thing I, ke I kept thinking the entire time watching him was just the fact that, like, this guy really fell to number nine in the draft. Mm. I mean, there were, there were several teams that could have taken him. Um, like you said, in summer league, he showed that he can hit the three. That was a question mark, obviously. 
was can this guy stretch out the floor? Um, he and the body control. I mean, this was a this is not a very tall guy, and he was banging down low. He takes the contact very well. I mean, he's six three, so it's not like he's he's undersized. But you know, he he took the contact very well. Um, in college, we know he averaged eighteen and six and four. This guy falling to number nine. Uh, I I can only imagine Mark Cuban's face in the boardroom in the draft room. You know when he had the option to pick Dennis Smith Jr. at nine, because like you said, you know I'm not a Knicks fan. Here the Knicks have the ability to draft a, a steal of a mm-hmm. player, and they always want to go no, no. European. I think the biggest thing that I took away from summer league was play with him. You see, when you you know you know you have a guy that's a special player. When every time he scores, the bench is hype. The bench is hype. They're happy for him to score. You know, at NC State, you really didn't see a lot of that because I guess between his attitude and his nonchalantness, you know, he got a bad rap. That's the only reason why he fell down to number nine was was attitude issues, the intangibles. They didn't feel like he could be a lead on the floor. If you watch the Summer League games go back, especially when it got to the playoff time, his team was happy for him whenever he made a good play. They were happy, legitimately happy for this kid. That's when you know that you have a special player on your hands. Xavier, if you had to go back and redo the draft, where do you think Dennis Smith Jr. would go? Ooh, I would see him. I couldn't see him falling past um, the Orlando Magic. That they would have picked him up, and because they need a new point guard, I think that he would have been a significant upgrade, especially for a team that has athletes on the wings that they can kind of get up and down with him. So I don't see him falling past past the Orlando Magic. Whoever called picked that Jonathan number? Isaac. Yeah, they went with Jonathan Isaac. What number did they pick at? Like six or seven? I think, yeah, I was, think they were five or six, yeah. It was somewhere around that range, but I don't see him going past Orlando. I don't think that they would have passed on him if they knew what they knew now. Where do you think – where do you guys think oh, um, Dennis Smith Jr. is going to finish in terms of rookie of the year? You know, you know I, is he going to win it? Is he going to be top three, top five? I think that if he gets them – Close to playoff contention, like, and I don't mean I don't mean they don't need the AC, but if they're if they're like two or three games out of the A spot, you know, he could win Rookie of the Year. Be out the realm of possibility because he's going to have all the opportunity to win Rookie of the Year. This position out of all like, like the top ten guys to make an immediate impact because he's going to get starters minutes right away his minutes unless he's just not cutting it like Emmanuel Moutier did in Denver. You know, so he's going to get plenty of opportunities. So I'll be surprised if he if he was in the top three. As I say, top three, I'll be surprised if he was in the top three. Yeah, this is like my reveal tour, it feels like, for my <laughs> top three Rookie of the Year candidates. Now, on the Kings, when I said De'Aaron Fox was in my top three, this is another guy in my top three for Rookie of the Year. Uh, at this point in time, I haven't made my exact prediction but this is probably my favorite, actually, to win it all. Yes, I picked, I'm picked. i probably going to pick him over Lonzo. Um, I just love the explosiveness. I mean, I'm just thinking back when the Mavericks, I, I want to say they played the Lakers in Summer League, and there was a point where he blew by Lonzo and threw down, like, a wicked, like, <laughs> single-handed Tomahawk dunk. And I was just like, all right, like, I'm all in. Like, I'm, I'm on board with this kid. And I just think with the Dallas offense, you know, like we said before, you know, Dirk's a little bit older. Harrison Barnes has developed well. You know, this team offensively struggled last year. You know, they'll need a point guard who's ready to take control of the offense. And I don't see why Dennis Smith Jr. couldn't be a top two or top three candidate for rookie of the year. Yeah, I mean, it seems like the Mavs really like him. And like Xavier mentioned, he should see good minutes too, which is always important if you're going to win rookie of the year. And I think what helps him a lot is he's going to be surrounded by a lot of veteran players, a lot of guys that know how to play. For him, it would be just to earn those guys' respect. This has been around a long time. So I think that once they see, yo, this kid can play, the reins and say, listen, this is your show. Let me just get me shots, give me shots here, give me shots there, but be aggressive and attack these other point guards in the league. So that's what really helps him a lot is that he has a veteran coach, veteran players, and a good culture, a good team culture that's going to help cultivate that talent. Yeah, like you mentioned, he has a good rim roller with uh, Nerlens Noel. So that's somebody to work the pick and roll with. Obviously, always having shooting big like Dirk helps. And then Harrison Barnes and Wesley Matthews are pretty good three-point shooters. And like we mentioned, Seth Curry's another guy too. So things could really go well for him in his rookie year, you know, just the, the crumbs fall the right way. But other additions, um, they didn't draft anybody else. 
Dennis Smith Jr. was their main pick. And you mentioned him before. They picked up Josh McRoberts and pretty much a salary dump. What are your thoughts on him? So I'm going to give Mavericks fans some hope for this with this guy. Josh McRoberts, when did he have his best season? Playing uh, with a shoot first point guard and Kemba Walker. What happened in this offense? They would do pick and roll. He would catch the ball and look to make the open pass or the easy pass. I can easily see him in a Rick Carlisle offense playing the same exact role where him and pick and roll, he rolls or he pops, and they give him the ball and he catches teams off a rotation. He's making extra passes to Harrison Barnes, Yogi Ferrell, Seth Curry, Dirk Nowinski. I can see him averaging those kind of assist numbers, not scoring numbers like he did in Charlotte, but those assist numbers we have in like maybe like assist a game just off the of ball movement because Rick Carlisle, very his coaching style when he's at his best is when he has guys that can make those extra passes. They need to increase their they need to increase their assist numbers so I can easily see him back up center or power forward spacing the floor and hitting guys with open jump shots. Man, um, yeah, I mean the, the issue with Josh Miller for me is just the fact he hasn't been very healthy in the last couple of years with Miami. I mean, obviously he was he was certainly at his best when he was with Charlotte. You know, I mean, his best year with Charlotte, he averaged eight, seven, and seven and five, which is, which is pretty. No, oh, yeah, which is pretty good. Um, and I just want to mention one. We there was one guy they signed Nick mm-hmm. outside of the draft, and PJ Dozer, uh, who I really like out of South Carolina. He's a six seven shooting guard, who they signed I think to a two way like a two way deal. He averaged like thirteen and. Yeah, and I, I think that could be a really good signing for him if he develops because he's a really gritty kind of guard. But, yeah, you know, Josh McRoberts, it, for me, it just depends on how healthy he can be and how much he still has left in the tank. Yeah, you made a great point about Josh McRoberts and his health. That's why I wouldn't probably buy into him. I think in five of the six – five out of the last six seasons, he's not even played 50 games. So, But, how about, but real quickly, how about the motivation of guys saying that he's not healthy, he's washed up? He can't play no more. You don't think that's going to add fuel to his fire to prove the guys that, listen, I was given I was given away in a salary dump. I wasn't even given away for a quality player. They traded me for A.J. Hammonds. I mean, it can't get no lower than that, you know. So I feel like he's going to take that motivation and prove the guys he can still play. If he can stay healthy, he probably can contribute. But, like, the health is a big issue. And I don't necessarily believe, you know, it's on him. Like, he's not taking care of himself. It could just be, like, his body's, you know, breaking down. He's a big guy. You know, he's about to approach 30. Sometimes when these big dudes get hurt, it's hard for them to get back to healthy. But like you said, if he's healthy, he can definitely have an impact. They probably wouldn't play him big minutes just because of his health, but he still could be, you know, a vet- nice veteran to have around. Yeah, that's all I'm saying. I'm, I'm saying it's not as bad as people make it out to see him. That's all I'm saying. Yeah, no, it's not. It's not like he's the worst player in the NBA. It's not like he's never done anything well, and he is a good passer at the big man position. Uh, what are your thoughts on P.J. Dozer, like Corey mentioned, uh, you know, a guy they signed to a two-way deal. Well, in my in my in our mock draft before, I had him going to the Lakers because for me, I just love the fact that he has the tools to be a very good defensive point guard. He has the tools to be a defensive point guard. You know, he has the tools. He has long arms. He's about six six five. You know, pretty tall point guard. And I feel like on the defensive side of the ball, he could really help an already stout defense when you have Nolan's Noel on the back line blocking shots. So I think that he could, if he could find minutes, because I'm trying to figure out where you're going to put him at. Are you going to take away minutes? You can't play him at the two because he can't shoot. Well, since he's on a two-way so, deal, he can spend a lot of time in the G League. I mean, he is six seven, so I, I kind of feel like he'll probably play more minutes at the two than the one, you know, for the defensive purposes. But like you said, I mean, this is a guy who offensively is very limited. You know, he, he doesn't shoot the three very well. Um, and, I mean, he doesn't have much of a jump shot in general. He's a guy who attacks the basket a lot. So, I mean, the D-League for me is the place I would want to see him go to first. I mean, prove to me that you can shoot the ball at least somewhat different, you know, decently before you get brought up to the NBA. But he is the guy, you know, who could make a defensive impact on a very good defensive team already. Well, that's I, mean, I mean, he has potential. He definitely has potential. If he goes out to the D-League, works on his ball handling, works on the jump shot, I could definitely see him being a two-way, you know, a decent three and D point guard if that's even possible. But I could definitely see that being possible and being plausible for the Mavericks to use. Well, I think with all the guards, unless they have an injury, it's going to be hard to find him minutes. But you never know. 
like when you have the two-way contract, it's not like the other guys you would send down to the G League and people could sign them if they weren't, you know, part of your roster. That two-way contract gives a team a lot of flexibility, and it probably means that they will go to the G League. Yeah, since we're talking about guys that they acquired, um, I just want to, like, throw this out there. Jeff Whitney's not a bad option as a third center on this team as well. You know, yeah, I he's see the guy who's that ready, are ready to come in and contribute. Like you said, that's not a bad signing at all. That was not a bad signing. He's a decent – he's played minutes before in, this, in the league. He's a shot blocker. He's he, he shows a willingness to block shots. He can set hard screens. He's a smart defender. I actually like him on this team as a as a third option at center. You know, you shouldn't give him a lot of minutes, but in spot minutes, he could contribute to this team a lot. I mean, he's another guy who's he's relatively, you know, he's relatively young. So, you know, this team is, is definitely moving in the right direction in terms of getting a little bit younger, you know, with guys like Dirk Shaw on the roster, getting rid of Darren Williams last year. Um, I agree with the fact that behind your own is Noel and behind um, – I'm drawing a blank on the backup center's name, Mirgia. I can't Mirgi. pronounce it. Yeah, Mirgi. Mirgi. Yeah. Besides, behind him, you know, it's not bad. If one of those guys get, you know, goes down with an injury, he could surely step up with some big minutes. Yeah, and they got him. They got him for cheap. He's only 1.5 million, and only 350 of that is guaranteed. So it's it's not a bad it's not a bad option to have as a backup center. There's worse options out there than Jeff Whitty as backup center. Exactly. And uh, mentioning, you know, big men, you know, the biggest deal for them was re-signing Nerland Snowell. They didn't sign him to the long-term ter- long term deal that they would have liked. He only signed the qualifying offer, so next year he's an unrestricted free agent. But bring back Nerland Snowell, obviously they want to keep him long-term. What do you think the impact he's going to have on the Mavs this year? I see him taking a leap defensively. Offensively, I think that we've seen what his peak. He's, a, he's not going to be a guy you throw the ball to, give him like 15 touches a game. He's a pick-and-roll finisher. He's a shot blocker. He's a rim protector. He's a rim runner. He's a rebounder. I think that's what he is. I think the problem with him is that he values himself more than that because he wanted a max contract from the Mavs, but they did the smart thing. You know, wait it out, see how this season goes, and then let's re- let's come back to the table next season. Um, I think we've seen the peak of him offensively. You know, this is like his fourth year in the league coming up, and we haven't seen much improvement offensively. Um, but defensively, he's a special talent defensively. He's a special defender, a very special defender. And I look for him to help bolster that defense even more. I look for him to be at least – if he can get more minutes, because he only played about 22 minutes a game last season. If he can get more minutes this year, I could see him easily being top 10, top 5 in blocks per game. Yeah, he's big time in the blocks, like you mentioned. He also is a big man that moves his feet well. He's quick, and he gets in the passing lanes as well. So, I mean, I love Nerlens Noel and what he can bring to this team. And if he can stay healthy, his problem in Philly was, you know, the situation wasn't necessarily great because he's so limited offensively. and He seemed like he was always injured. But if he stays healthy, he definitely can have a big impact. Yeah, Yeah, and I um, think – Go go ahead, Xavier, go ahead. And I think from a financial standpoint that I think he's – they're probably going to – they're going to have a really good chance of re-signing him next season because I don't see any team really paying the max dollar for him for a center that – really can't give you much offensively. So I think that they're going to probably re-sign him with a little bit more money than what they offered him this year. But I think that he's a safe bet to kind of stay in Dallas because that's already a starting position available. You don't got to beat on anybody for minutes. And you're going to know the system. You're going to, This is going to be your second year in the system. You're going to know the system. So I think that they have a pretty good chance of re-signing him next season. I'm huge on Nerland's Noel. I absolutely love this guy. Um, I was actually hoping that last year the Boston Celtics would have made a move for him because this is the kind of rim protector the Celtics could have used. Um, this is a guy who, like you, you guys mentioned, you know, he blocks shots, he can rebound. Offensively, he's no different really than a Tyson Chandler or a DeAndre Jordan. You know, he's not going to give you a post move. He's not going to give you a jump shot. You know, he's really much an oop and a around the rim kind of guy. But, you know, he's 22 years old are a little bit of a concern. The guys just got to stay healthy. Um, you know, and, you know, last year, he, he or this, you know, we're talking about four weeks ago, this guy could have been locked up long term because I know it was reported that he turned down a four-year, $70 million contract from the Mavericks, shooting himself in the foot. Um, I'm not sure. He wanted $20 million a year is what he actually wanted, and he ended up getting $4.1 million for a year. Um, we'll have to see if that, you know, bites him in, you know, the rear end coming up. But 
Um, this is definitely a guy who I think could get more money in the future, especially seeing how much like DeAndre Jordan got, you know, a couple of years ago. Well, there was also a report saying that uh, I think Nerland Sowell's agent said that offer was never on the table and that wasn't true. But who knows? We'll never really know. I think, you know, there's a few things that help the Mavs. Obviously, like Xavier mentioned, he'll be around Dallas and maybe he'll start to like things around there. Also, a lot of teams are going to be hard capped next year, so they're not going to have the money to spend. But if he has a big year, I wouldn't be surprised if one of these rebuilding team teams take a swing at him just because, like Corey mentioned, he's still a really young player. So he is somebody who can grow with your team. So I wouldn't be surprised if someone's willing to take a chance on him next year. Yeah, I, I honestly don't think that a lot of teams are going to be throwing that kind of money around because let's think about the last center outside of DeAndre Jordan, who was an all-star this season. But the last center that was a defensive-minded center that really got paid a lot of money was Tyson Chandler. And that kind of didn't work out too yeah, much. How's Hassan Whiteside? What about Hassan Whiteside? I'm not talking about guys that are all-stars now. I'm not talking about guys <laughs> that are all-stars. Because no one's well is nowhere near Hassan okay, Whiteside. Okay, 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 you're right, you're right. Okay, and that's, that's the sense. He's more like a – like you, you said just say he's more of a Tyson Chandler. A Tyson Chandler. Right. Yeah, you're right. Got, no, no, you're right. You got me. Well, one thing I'll say about Nerland so well, though, that makes him pretty valuable is his ability to defend multiple positions because he's, you know, able to get on the perimeter a little bit compared to other bigs. So that, you know, it depends on how well he does this year. We'll see what happens next year in the offseason. But in terms of departures, you know, they really didn't lose anybody. You know, they lost a few guys that were on the team, like, for half the season. Uh, DeAndre Liggins, A.J. Hammonds, like you mentioned, uh, Nicholas Brazumo. So no big losses for the Mavs. Anybody that sticks out for you guys or And that that really, you know, the, the Mavs roster last year was a revolving door. The like roster, said, eight point guards. The eight point guards. I'm looking at the roster. They had one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, twenty one, twenty two, twenty three, twenty. 22, 23, played minutes for them last year. So they were a revolving door on the back line. So guys coming Mark Cuban's model is guys come and guys go. So, <laughs> so it's not much, not really much to talk about losses because a lot of the guys on the back end were duty players and guys that are journeymen. So not really much to talk about in terms of losses. Yeah, no, uh, goodbye, good riddance to almost anyone they lost. You know, some, it's like, what's the saying? A loss isn't always a loss. There, there wasn't any losses here. Only, only player that I kind of will give to is Justin Anderson because he's one of those guys that's a hard worker, energy guy that loves to compete. You know, I think he would have been good for – but in terms of actual NBA ability, they didn't lose much. Yeah, I mean, he he's a weird player. I think he must have gotten, you know, Carlisle's, like, doghouse or something because he played a good amount good amount of minutes his rookie season. Then his second year in the league, he just didn't seem to have as big an impact and play as many minutes. So something was probably up with him getting – he was part of that Nerland Sowell deal. But let's talk uh, starters for next season. Who is starting the Mav- Who is starting for the Mavs on opening night? I'm gonna go the starting lineup. This is just, this is what starting lineup should be: Dennis Smith at the one, Wesley Wesley Matthews at the two, Harrison Barnes, Dirk Nowitzki, and Nolan's Noel. That that power forward position, they should try, you know, to bring Dirk off the bench. Had sacrilegious as that sounds, but you paid Dwight Powell money last season. A contributor, so he needs to get more, more minutes if you're going to pay him nine million a year, you know. So that's just my personal take. But they're going to start Dirk only because Dirk is Dirk. See, I look the Dwight Powell to kind of get almost like that six starter kind of minutes where he takes a lot of the minutes and the load off for Dirk and Winsky. Yeah, um, for, I, I'm going with pretty much, I'm going with the same exact starting five: Dennis Smith Jr., Wesley Matthews, Harrison Barnes. I think Dirk at least starts off the year starting. I'm not sure if that will stay like that the whole year. And then uh, with Nerland and Well finishing at the five. Yeah, uh, you guys are pretty spot on. I think Dirk, like you guys mentioned, will probably play around 20 minutes this year. Getting up there in age, I want to keep him fresh, at least so he can play the whole season. So um, I could see them doing that. I also could see them, you know, like you guys mentioned, maybe Dirk going to the bench, playing Harrison Barnes at the four, Wesley Matthews at the three, and starting somebody else at the two, like a Seth Curry. That could be interesting. It would give them a lot of spacing offensively and some firepower. Yeah. yeah. Like I said, Dirk is really handcuffed in the roster because there is potential for a faster lineup. Dirk is minutes. You have to play with Nolan Snowells because he has to play with a center that can rebound and block shots because and block shots as well as he could have, which wasn't really good before. So 
Yeah, Noel's, like you said, a great pair with him because Noel can kind of make up for him defensively because he's so quick and that weak side, you know, attention he can bring and protect the rim. But breakout starter for the Mavs next year. So for me, I have my breakout starter. You know, I have I have a tie about it. The more that this guy has to break out, Smith. But my man Corey has convinced me that no one's going to be the breakout player this year. I think that if he wants to get that max contract that he wants – upper that almost like top 10 center money he has to play to be a borderline all-star well not a really borderline all-star but you have to look at the center position to be like all right top 10 center in the league you know so i think that he should have a breakout season if he wants that money now if he doesn't want that money and he plays goes out there and you know lolly guys around it it's going to be dennis dennis smith dennis will be the breakout player because he's going to be rookie of the year there you go. Bold prediction right there. First award given out. Yeah, uh, I'm, I am I do like that I convinced you on your list as well. I'm proud of myself. I'm patting myself <laughs> on the back currently. Um, but I'm rolling with Dennis Smith Jr. Uh, because he is definitely my top super rookie of the year. I'm not ready to claim that yet. I'll probably have a piece out eventually for OTG about who I got winning what. But um, I'm going to say Dennis Smith Jr. I think this kid's going to come out of the gate hot. Um, I'm not saying it translates into wins. But I definitely think this kid is, is on pace in my book to average paying at least, you know, 16 to 17 with six and five or seven and five, something right around, right around there. Yeah, yeah. I, I like both these guys that have big years, like you said, but I'm going to go with Nerland Noel as well. I want to see him, you know, have a full season in Dallas, see him have that opportunity. And like you said, he could, you know, maybe establish himself as a top 10 center, especially with his defensive ability. And Dennis Smith Jr., you know, like you mentioned, he'll have a great opportunity. If he does anything like what he did in summer league, it should be an exciting season for the Mavs. Not necessarily in the win totals, but just, you know, the youth development. Yes, sir. Breakout bench guy. Oh, man, this is a tough decision because they got a lot of guys on the bench that, you know, could potentially have breakout years. But I'm just looking at uh, – this is a purely financial decision as this guy has to have a breakout year to justify the contract that he, he was given. Is 37 mil. Give me more. The White Power has to have a breakout year. I'm gonna pick. I'm gonna pick him have a breakout year because I think he's going to take few minutes. So I could see him playing 24, 25, 26, maybe even, maybe even touch that 30 minute mark if he plays really well. They have to almost have. They have to usher him out the door somehow, some way. And the only way for that to happen. It's one of these power forwards to come in and take that spot from him. So I'm going to go with Dwight Powell because this year he's going to be making $9 million. Next year he makes $9 million, and then the year after that he makes $10 million. So he has to start earning his money. He got to earn his money. He got to earn his money or else this will be money that was not well spent. What about you, Corey? Well, I, that's, a, I, that's an interesting one. I would never have picked Dwight Powell. Probably we made this podcast like 10 times over. I probably never would have picked him, so I like that. Um, I'm going with probably the easiest choice off the bench, Seth Curry. Um, we saw Seth finally take a uh, a jump in his game. Um, we saw him no longer become the other Curry in the league. Last year, he was he was you know big time. Finally, it looked like maybe he worked with Steph, you know, in the off season prior to last season. I I really think Seth, you know, getting you know because Seth was a player who we saw bounce around the league a lot. Now he's finally in Dallas, and it looks like he'll stay in Dallas for at least a foreseeable future. And I think that will help him, you know, get better implanted within the offense. You know, like we said, they brought in Dennis Smith Jr. Um, I, I really like to bring for this team off the bench. I think we mentioned earlier, you know, this is a guy who possibly could be a uh, six-man-of-the-year candidate at some point in his career. Yeah. Yeah. Only, reason why, only reason why I'm going to go with the White Powers is because I'm looking at the roster – He's their third best big after Dirk Nowitzki, Nolan's Noel. Seth Curry, he's going to have to compete with Yogi Ferrell for shots. Those two are shot makers. They're shot makers and shot takers. They both see shots that they never see a shot that they don't like. You know, <laughs> so I think on the perimeter, those two guys are going to have to try to figure out a way to play with each other because they're both going to come off the bench and both going to be expected to a lot of pop. Whereas Dwight Powell, he's coming off the bench as, as a forward, and who's going to take shots from him? On that four spot, or that three, or that or that five spot, not Missouri, not McRoberts, you know, not Withy, you know, he's the third best big coming off the bench, 
going off the bench. So that's the only reason I'm going with Dwight Powell because the opportunity is there. Dirk Nowitzki is like, his minutes. He's like, please, I don't want to run up and down this court <laughs> game for me. I think the white power to go ahead and grab the starting position that's there for him to take. I mean, that is definitely a good point about Powell because the minutes will be there for opportunity. We're so, you know, Seth Curry's going to have to compete with multiple guys. I think with all the guards and, you know, the actual talent being in the guard position, they, like I said, I wouldn't be surprised if they moved Harrison Barnes a little bit more at the four, Wesley Matthews a little bit more at the three, so they can play these guards a little bit more because they have a lot of talent there. And I think they're going to want to have a guy like Seth Curry on the floor because they need that type of floor spacing, especially when you have a player like Noel who isn't necessarily, you know, somebody who can do a lot offensively. Seth Curry kind of balanced on that with his three-point shooting. But let's talk wins. Best case scenario win-wise for the Mavs this year, Xavier. My best case scenario would not be everyone else's best case scenario. Is them acquiring more talent. Them acquiring draft picks. Them acquiring ping pong balls. My best case scenario is that they, they give excitement early on in the season where, you know, Mark Cuban said himself that they was trying to tank once they realized they were out of playoff contention. But I think the best case scenario is let Dennis Smith win rookie of the year. Usher Dirk Dumiski out of out of the limelight. Position themselves to get a top five pick in this next year's draft. If they do win games, are they gonna make the playoffs realistically? No, I don't I don't there's there's nine teams, ten teams in the West that are better than them. Compete, they're gonna get another middle of the road middle of the road, you know, first round pick. And this draft is not going to be as good as last year's draft. So that's the case scenario is 11, 12, 13 spot. But also games that they compete in, but just end up falling short because they run out of gas and like that. So I think like the best case scenario would be to, for them to be in 13th in the West and get potentially another top 10, top five pick. All right. Um, my best case scenario for them is because I I don't think this team is going to be as the best case scenario for a team that's trying to rebuild. Uh, my best case scenario for them win wise though is probably going to be I think they actually win a cu- couple more games next year than they did last year. So I'm thinking right around you know thirty four or thirty five wins. Yeah, I mean, there's obviously always two best-case scenarios for all these teams we talk about that aren't really going to make the playoffs because there's always, you know, win some extra games, maybe compete for the eighth seed, or, you know, let the young guys play and finish in the bottom five and end up with a really high pick. So I think either scenario kind of works out for the Mavs. Obviously, getting the high pick, and something I mentioned off-air, you know, I don't know if Dennis Smith Jr. is going to be that superstar, big star player you need. Maybe if you can land a top five, top three pick, that could be huge for the franchise. Xavier mentioned it, maybe make some trades. You know, maybe move some of these veterans and try to get another first-round pick. You know, just keep adding young talent. And, you know, when Dirk's ready to leave, you will complete that rebuild. So that, there's two best-case scenarios for all these bad teams. But worst-case scenario for the Mavs. Um, the worst-case scenario for the Mavericks is that they, that they, you know, they improve on our 33 wins and they get somewhere between, um, we'll say, 37 to 40 wins. Pop- of them to get to 40 wins. You have a team that if they were in the East, they would be in the playoffs. I'm, I'm confident that if they were in the Eastern Conference, they'd be in the playoffs. So, um, the, you know, worst case scenario is that they actually compete for a playoff spot instead of them getting ping pong balls. So that's the only reason I say that's the worst case scenario. Hey, I just want them to have a direction for the franchise. That's for me. Like, when I look at their roster, like I said before, direction yet. But I think after this season, they'll have a lot more clarity on what they want to do as a franchise. Yeah, um, my worst case scenario is probably their best case scenario. If we're talking about them winning uh, ping pong balls, I'm saying worst case scenario is they win, you know, 27 to 28 games. We see Dirk, uh, you know, Father Time finally catch him uh, completely. Maybe uh, Nerlens Noel doesn't stay healthy. Maybe Seth Curry doesn't have as good of a year. Uh, Dennis Smith Jr. disappoints me, and I go cry in a corner. Um, <laughs> you know, that, that for me is the worst-case scenario here for Dallas. 
Yeah, I think, you know, having a bad win total in that 26 to 28 range and not seeing players develop, but it does help because you'll get a high pick. So there's, you know, there's a, a half cup, half empty kind of type of thing here because, you know, best and worst case, it depends how you're looking at the situation. But realistically, what do you think is going to happen for the Mavs next year? I think that they're going to – I think that Dennis Smith will account for two more wins. And I think they get the 35 wins games. People take notes of Dennis Smith as a potential – Soft for years to come after a lot of these other point guards usher themselves out. Ski shows glimpses of, you know, the old Dirk where he hits a game winner here, a game winner there. Point quarter where it was just like, ooh, Dirk Nowitzki still has a lot left in the tank. So I think I think that they get 35 wins because, you know, Dennis Smith, I honestly Dennis Smith is that good. That's just my own personal take. You know, I had him going to the Knicks. So I just think that he's that good where you Counts for two more wins. It gets them to 35, where we'd be like, the future is bright for this franchise. Uh, yeah, m- my pick is they finish with 33, 34 wins. They're, you know, my, you know, I know my best case scenario was 34, 35. So I'm going to say 34 wins. I'm going to say Dennis Smith Jr. adds one or two wins. But I'll say he yeah, accounts for one or two wins, but I don't think it makes him much better than last year. You know, I'm still looking at a roster that, we, there's a lot of there's a lot of question marks on this team, so you, we're gonna have to see you know how players develop. Like, you know, you mentioned it earlier, like to start off the pod, their assist numbers last year. You know, if this team doesn't become a better ball moving team, uh, I don't see them winning that many more games than last year. Yeah, realistically, I think you guys are pretty close to what they're going to be. I probably have them at 35. You know, I think there will be some improvements. And if the veterans stay healthy, they have like a nice mix because they do have some guys that have done it in the NBA a little bit already, even though they're still relatively young. So things could really work out well for the Mavs. And, you know, not only will they win 30-plus games, but they'll also have a direction for the team and they'll have a better idea. You know, is Harrison Barnes, is Dennis Smith Jr., is Nerlens Noel, are they our cornerstones for the future? Are we ready to move on with those guys? Or do we still need to find another young piece to build around? Yeah, I think um, with this team, I think that they need to start consolidating some of these assets into stars or, you know, I see a guy like Wesley Matthews who can still play in this league is relatively for this, for this new NBA, his contract isn't, it, it's not a great contract, but it's not a bad contract either. And for him now, he'll be an expiring contract next year. I can see him getting a couple of young players for Wesley Matthews. Um, I just think that they need to really start considering starting to build around young talent. That's my two cents on that situation. Let's move on to the truth. And our emoji today for the Mavs, this is one that was kind of tough to come up with. I did with like the half moon, you know, the one side light and the one side dark because you know, the Mavs could be in the right direction. We can see the bright side of things, but we also can see the dark side of things where, you know, they don't necessarily have an identity yet and they don't know what's going to happen with that future because they don't have a ton of young assets until they move some of these veterans. I agree. Um, the emoji that I would like to have would be the emoji where you have the children and the parents, because I kind of see Dirk Nowitzki as the parent, and he has a lot of these young kids and Farrell, Dennis Smith. So I like that. Well. I, I like that. I actually like that. That's the first time I probably liked it better than my own. That's a pretty good one because they still have some veterans and they're taking care of the young guys because there is some real young dudes on this team. Um. All right. So I'm just going with a, a playful one. Uh, the emoji I got is the emoji with like the cowboy hat on. We're, we're talking about the Dallas Mavericks, and I just picture Mark Cuban being very happy with his team, because Mark Cuban, <laughs> for some reason, he you know he loves having Dirk. Obviously, that that's his guy. You know, he won him a title, and I think he he's gonna fall in love with Dennis Smith Jr. I know he likes New Orleans Noel because he wouldn't have traded for him if he didn't. And I just think we may not see the direction fully. Out of faith in Mark Cuban, he's probably one of my top ten favorite people in the world in general between Shark Tank and everything else he does. Mm -hmm. Um, So I think he's enjoying the, this kind of slow, but steady rebuild. Do y'all think like his love with Dirk Nowitzki is the same as Jerry Jones's love for Tony Romo? Like I kind of get that vibe from that. He would do anything for this guy. I think it might be bigger. (laughs) Yeah, it probably is bigger. He gave him a championship. Why not? Why not be bigger? Yeah, if true. Tony won a championship for Jerry, then it might be it might be more Jerry, but Tony Tony couldn't do it. 
them damn Cowboys. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> talking talking league pass, where do you rank the Mavs in terms of one through ten on league pass? I gave him a six. And it's Smith. Like, I'm really excited to see what this kid can do this year. You know, he has the whole league in front of him. He's going to have a challenge every night. I, I kind of want to see him test his chops against some of these other point guards. Russell Westbrook. Can't wait to see him play Steph Curry. That's going to be that's gonna be crazy. Him going at Lonzo Ball with Lonzo Ball talking all this trash about Nas and hip-hop and whatnot. I, I want to see that. <laughs> I want to see him go up against a lot of these point guards and see where he stands against these point guards, you know? He wants to be a top five point guard. He wants to be – so he's going to get his opportunity every night to prove it. Especially in the West. Especially in the West. Cause you, got, you even got Tony Parker who's still chugging along, you know, in the seat. That's why I gave him a six because I'm not really interested in, you know, a lot of these other guys. But Dennis Smith has my full attention. Yeah, um, what about you, I'm Corey? rolling. I'm rolling with a six. Uh, I'm tying my my high for league pass. Uh, I think Dennis Smith Jr. like like you said is going to be extremely fun and entertaining to watch. Um, I'm not seeing, I'm not seeing, uh, you know, a a crazy, a crazy love for the guys around him yet. Um, I think Harrison Barnes is still enjoyable to watch, but a lot of these guys need other players to make them look better. And like you said, uh, Nick, this could be Dirk's last year. Um, so I'm interested to see, you know, Dirk play if it is his final time. That's why I was so high on the Kings as well. Because, you know, seeing old guys like Vince Carter and Dirk, because this could possibly be their last year. So if, you know, seeing a superstar, a future Hall of Famer, um, you know, I want to soak that in. Yeah. Uh, for me, which is still pretty high ranking, it's 5 out of 10. Xavier didn't know I got a uh, skewed ranking. The Warriors are number 10, no team at number 9. But for the Mavs, I'll go 5 out of 10. Like you guys said, Dennis Smith Jr., there's some other young guys to watch. It seems like they always play scrappy, the Mavs. So, you know, there'll be a team. But what – you'd watch the Mavs over what TV show that you like? None. <laughs> <laughs> like, no, nah, if I had to choose one, I would kind of say um, American Dad – you know, it doesn't it doesn't come on that that often no more. So, if it is on, but I can choose to watch the Mavericks, I'll, I'll watch the Mavericks, and I just I'll just record American Dad. But Dennis Smith is not really the most entertaining of teams with the way that they play. All right, um, this was this was tough. All right, um, for me, I'm gonna pick uh, that '70s show. Um, I do like that '70s show because obviously it's funny. I'm not going to pick a show that I've watched uh, about 18 times over over the Dallas Mavericks. <laughs> Those are pretty good choices. I, I'm going to go with uh, I watch the Mavs over Dexter. I never like I always really? get, I'll go. I always get into Dexter a little bit, but then like Dexter's just so fake because he never gets caught. I never finished the show yet, but it just seems like so many things happen to go his way. And I also I'm like very obviously biased because I like the NBA, so it's hard for any TV show to really win this competition. Yeah, that is true too. I was trying to show them, like, I was like the Mavericks. Uh. But that wraps it up for today. Xavier Corey, thanks for hopping on. As always, thanks everybody for listening. Also, make sure you hit that subscribe button. Adios, fellas. It's been a pleasure. Been nice. Good talk.